Augustov rises above the picturesque Polish countryside, situated by the border that separates Poland from Russia. The gently rolling fields were rich and fertile. Woodlands dotted the abundant region and wildlife flourished in the inviting habitat. The landscape provided a diverse bounty for anyone settling nearby. Upon seeing the beautiful plot of land, surrounded by lakes and rivers for the first time, King Sigismundus Augustus proclaimed it a city for the king. In 1557, he chartered the town and gave it his name. Within 20 years of its founding, Augustus opened its borders and allowed Jews to settle in the city. From that moment on, Augustus was infused with the culture and heritage of the Jewish people. By 1630, the history of the town began to record the contributions of the Jews. 100 years later, Augustus was consumed by fire, but the citizens rebuilt. Augustus prospered. Jews were welcomed in the city, and Augustus' Jewish population went from 23% in 1800 to a population of 45% only 60 years later. Among the Jews in Augustov were the family of Naomi Zeven. In 1979, she made a journey to Augustov to see her father's home. I remember my father telling me stories about Augusta. As a little girl, I could listen for hours as he talked about his childhood. Even now, I can still hear his voice. Augusta had never seemed quite real. I never thought I'd have an opportunity to visit. My father's name was Max Sikolsky. His family owned a house in the center of the town, on the town square. While my father was growing up, he and his five brothers lived in the back of the house with the servants. His two sisters, Basha and Mary, lived in the front of the house with his mother and father. Both my grandfather and great-grandfather owned clothing stores in Augusta. In those days, the marketplace was 100% Jewish. My father loved the excitement of market days. Merchants from throughout the countryside crowded their carts into the town square. The carts were filled to overflowing with all their goods. For him, market day was an adventure. One day, my father announced he was going to swim the Netta River. By the time he reached the other side, he had become a local legend. Poland was a Catholic country, so times were never easy for Jewish people my family prospered. They were involved in a number of activities, both religious and civic. One of my uncles was a fireman, which was quite an honor in those days. With the outbreak of World War I, all able-bodied men were conscripted into the Russian army. My father was too young for the army, but he was strong and athletic. My father's love of the rivers made him a natural to be a logger. He loved being out in the open air, riding bareback, hunting wild boar, and riding those logs. When the men returned from the army, they found the traditional jobs in Augusta gone. So most of the people left for the industrial jobs in the cities. America held even more promise. So in 1918, when my father was 18, he left for America with two of his brothers. At Ellis Island, he was given a new name, Mortimer Sokol, and a new life. But he never forgot Augusta. The year after Naomi's father left for America, Poland received independence. The shifting of the population continued. The Jews had once made up over half of Augustus' population. Now they represented only one quarter of the city's 12,000 citizens. One of the 4,000 Jews who called Augustus home was Rachel Nunberg. To me, it was like a dream town. I was happy here. I had my friends here. I grew up here. I was born here. I had my whole life here. My parents used to send me to gymnasium, and that was hard. In this time, everybody couldn't go in. And there was 
120 this year that I went, and I felt I was, I was somebody special. We were from a rich family. My father used to be a wholesaler. He used to deliver for the army, and he always used to sell the kosher meat to the kosher butchers. I had my piano lessons. I was going to yeshiva, yeah. and there was my uncle who was the teacher there, and he was teaching five generations. I, most of the time, was always with friends and always talking to everybody. I was a friendly person, I guess. I knew all the people from town, like, my generation, little higher generation, little older generation, and even older people. It was like, like a family. And I always felt like I had everything. The rise of the Third Reich led to the most tragic chapter in Augustus' history. Adolf Hitler addressed the Reichstag. Today, I will again be a prophet. If the international Jewish finance power structure, inside and outside of Europe, should succeed in plunging the nations into another world war, then the end result will not be the Bolshevization of the earth, and therefore a victory of the Jews, but it will result in the extinction of the Jewish race in Europe. Hitler's words were greeted with great enthusiasm by Germany's rulers. Nationalism filled Germany and spilled over its borders. On June 22, 1941, the German army marched into Augustov, capturing the city. 1,200 Jewish males were rounded up, taken to the forest, and executed. Within a year, all the remaining Jews, women, children, and old men, were deported to concentration camps in Treblinka and Auschwitz. Trains entered the camps filled with prisoners and returned empty. No one was spared from the inhumanity as Hitler's army moved forward with its plan to annihilate the entire Jewish population. The exterminations were carried out with systematic precision. The concentration camps worked around the clock to make Hitler's final solution a reality. Within four years, more than half of the European Jewish population died at the hands of Nazi forces. Towns and villages across the Polish countryside were totally depopulated. The Augustov that greeted Naomi Zivin was a city without a single Jew. The stories that Max Sokolsky shared with his daughter existed only as memories. Upon her arrival in Augustov, Naomi sought out an interpreter to guide her through the city where she hoped to find someone who had known her family. She longed to visit the Jewish cemetery and pay her respects to the graves of her ancestors. She contacted Regina Bukshinska, an English-speaking teacher who knew of a man many considered to be the unofficial historian. Regina introduced Naomi to Józef Babkowski. During the German occupation, Babkowski risked his life and his family's safety by bringing up a teenage Jewish girl as his own daughter. The 79-year-old Babkowski eagerly talked to Naomi. Yes, he knew. He knew your great-grandfather, your grandfather, and your father. They had, uh, your grandfather had a store over the street. But during the war, it was destroyed. Even the street was destroyed. You know, I'd like to go to the Jewish cemetery and pay my respects. But there is no Jewish cemetery. What do you mean? Uh, I have lived here for 23 years, and I haven't heard about any. Well, ask Mr. Babkowski. Maybe he knows if there's any. Yes, he knows. He, he can show us. Oh, proszę bardzo. To jest tu ten cmentarz. What do you mean? Where is the cemetery? Here is the cemetery. 
It's a place. Tak, tu jest zaraz jeszcze tylko domek, w którym znaczy przygotowywali ciała do do pogrzebu. Może There is a house tak. where the bodies were prepared for the funeral. Tak. He But where are all the headstones? Tak. To jest mentaż tylko Gdzie był są... dewastowany. Where are the headstones? I don't know. Well, are the bodies tak. here? To pójdziemy zobaczyć yes, ten dom. Dobrze. The bodies of Augustus' Jews once lay in a cemetery that drew families together during moments of grief, a cemetery that has chronicled the long tradition of Jewish history in Augustus. Now the bodies rest in silent, unmarked graves. The carved markers that bore the names of generations of Jews had been taken away. In this act of desecration, many were broken and used as paving stones. Everything Jewish, people, objects and artifacts were relocated to a small section of town that became the Jewish ghetto. Jewish families were crowded into the small houses in the ghetto while their own homes and businesses were given away or taken over by the army. The isolation of everything Jewish was another step toward the total destruction of the Jewish population. In the ghetto, I saw tombstones scattered on the ground, but the names were unfamiliar. The German army had tried to destroy any knowledge of the vast Jewish life in Augusta. I couldn't forget that overgrown field full of broken headstones. I couldn't forget the majestic woods where all the Jewish men in Augusta had been killed. If my father hadn't left for America, he probably would have died there too. I kept wondering exactly where my ancestors were buried, where the other Jewish families of Augusta were buried. I could hear my father repeating the stories of this idyllic town and the beautiful lakes and forests surrounding it. After being in Augusta, his stories came alive for me. I finally understood the excitement and joy my father felt when he talked of his hometown. This Augusta was not the Augusta of my father's childhood. I couldn't let the good memories die. I knew I had to do something. I wanted the cemetery consecrated again. I wanted a place that other families could visit. Also, I dreamed of a memorial to honor the Jews who died in the Holocaust. When I returned to the United States, I went to the Polish embassy. I hadn't anticipated the obstacles, but it didn't matter. I knew this was something I had to do for myself as well as for my father. But times were not easy in Poland. Food shortages and domestic unrest caused mounting pressure on the government. The workers in the shipyards were growing increasingly militant and dissatisfied with the government's inability to deal with the domestic problems. They began organizing and making demands. Hours of negotiations between workers dragged into weeks. The labor union Solidarity was gaining increasing support among the workers who took their dissatisfaction to the streets. The Catholic Church sided with the needs and demands of the workers and boldly ministered to them during the tensions of the ongoing strikes. The international media descended on the Polish cities and followed the activities of Solidarity's charismatic leader, Lech Wałęsa. They speculated on the duration of the strikes and the patience of the government in dealing with the union. They waited to see when and if the government would send tanks rolling streets to bring an end to Solidarity. With all the internal turmoil, it seemed unlikely that any official would give priority to the issue of granting permission to build a memorial in Augustów. Against this turbulent backdrop, Naomi remained determined, even when her request was turned down by the mayor of Augustów. 
While waiting for the new mayor to take office, she contacted a Warsaw sculptor to design and build the memorial. Bronisław Stawiński, first secretary of the Polish embassy, remembered the difficulties. Well, when Naomi came for the first time to me, I didn't know what to do, how to help her, and I, I wanted to help her. She, she had the idea of, of uh, constructing a monument on the Jewish cemetery in Augustov. The monument which will also, which would uh, commemorate the Jewish who perished in Poland during the Holocaust period. But I could only help in uh, giving uh, advices, in putting in touch with the proper people. So, so what, what, what I, I, I did what I could. In the end, when the new mayor agreed, the government allowed the memorial to be constructed. Since the Holocaust of World War II, there had been little mention of the thousands of Polish Jews who were executed in the war. Naomi Zivin returned again to Augustov for the dedication ceremony. With her were several Americans who had lived in Augustov. Sam Gadowski, who left in 1939, Rachel Nunberg, whose childhood memories ended with three years in Auschwitz, her daughter Sherry, and Luba Feldman, who left in 1937. Father Stanisław Chłochowski of Augustów spoke of his wartime experience. This gathering of ours is very unusual. But I am glad that the benefactor of today's ceremony has invited us Roman Catholic clergy and that we are represented. In a concentration camp between Linz and Vienna, Mauthausen, I was incarcerated in 1940. It was a stone quarry called Vernichtungslager. They were killing those people, the ones working the roller. There were four of us Catholic priests and 17 Jews. We were hitched like horses to the roller to smooth the ground that was being prepared for a new concentration camp. One day, the commandant of the camp gave the order to hunt for the Jews from the group that I was in, the group that was pulling the roller. The Jews tried to escape. They would run, fall down, and drag themselves up from the dirt. They would run a few steps ahead and fall down again. They were beaten repeatedly with the wooden planks used to measure the new camp. It was clear that they would not part with their lives without a struggle. Only after several such falls would they accept death. Their bodies were beaten repeatedly until they were left without life. The assembled crowd listened to the priest's personal account of the horrors of the war. They remembered the past as they stood before the newly erected memorial. The director of the religious affairs for the region, Stanisław Grochowski, opened the dedication. We come together today with tremendous respect to pay tribute to those who died fighting, to those who were murdered, persecuted, executed, tortured by the Nazis, Polish citizens of Jewish nationality. We are unveiling this monument with the intention of bringing back the memory of the people who were living here, working here, and who made this area grow. Fellow citizens who were martyred here by the hands of Hitler's human slaughterers. I declare the ceremony officially open. I would like to invite the mayor of Augusto, Mr. Heinrich Belovsky, to speak. We're gathered here in a special place. Here rest thousands of dead Jews who were living on the Augusto lands before 1939, before the German barbaric invasion of Poland, which started the long years of biological extermination of the Polish nation.
Let this obelisk, which is rising here, symbolize and commemorate the people of Jewish origin who were natives of Augusto. Moses Finkelstein, the chairman of the Jewish Religious Association of Poland, spoke to the crowd. The dedication of the monument at the Jewish cemetery in Augusto is a meaningful and very special moment. It is touching proof of human and family memory and also has a deep symbolic meaning. Today's ceremony not only commemorates those Jewish people resting in our land, but it also commemorates the tragic destiny of the Jewish people during the events of the last war, which brought about inhuman extermination. Jewish people have been living in Augusto for many, many centuries. Before the Second World War, 30% of our population was Jewish. They were creating a spirit and atmosphere in their beautiful city. They ran many industrial and commercial enterprises and bigger works like flour mills and sugar companies. There was also a large community of intelligentsia, doctors, teachers, and clerks. Social life blossomed with the activity of different organizations. There were social, political, and religious groups. There were youth groups and guilds and trade unions, even a teacher's college and library. The religious life had a tremendous influence in the life of the Jewish community and the entire city. I knew I had to return to Augusta, where my father loved so much. So I want you all to keep remembering the wonderful things the Jewish culture was and is. The people that helped build this memorial are too numerous to mention. So I have their names here, and I'm going to bury it in your ground with the, your blessings. And I want to thank them from all my heart. And in the name of the Jewish religion, we always leave stones on our graves so that it's a calling card to say that we were here and we love you. And I thank you all for being here today. Gently. After the war, Jewish congregations were in ruin. Three million Polish Jews died. There was not a single rabbi left alive. Because of this tragedy, an American rabbi traveled to Augustov to reconsecrate the cemetery and offer a prayer for the dead. The memories of the Holocaust remain alive for people who suffered at the hands of the Third Reich. But many try to forget the horrors of the concentration camps, hoping they will fade into history as the years pass. Of the six million Jews who died during the Holocaust, half were Polish Jews. Today in Poland, there are only 10,000 Jews in a population of 38 million. The story of the Jews in Augustov is a familiar one. Across the Polish countryside, hundreds of small towns suffered the same fate. Cemeteries were desecrated, their gravestones uprooted and broken. The bodies of countless Polish Jews lay forgotten with unmarked graves. But the hatred and persecution of the Second World War was not abolished with the liberation of the concentration camps. 50 years after the German invasion of Poland, anti-Semitism is on the rise. In Germany, the Soviet Union, the United States, Poland, and France, newspapers are filled with the stories and pictures of Jewish cemeteries that are again being desecrated.
skinheads look up to Hitler as a hero, adopting his legacy of violence and terrorism. Building facades are littered with the graffiti of racial hatred and religious persecution. There is a new resurgence of the nationalism that saw Hitler's brown shirts fill the streets. Anti-Semitic groups gather and march with the familiar raised arm salute that rallied Hitler's troops. The same scenes are being replayed over and over today. Amid the growing hostility stands a single marble monument. The story of the Jewish cemetery in Augusto does not end with the dedication ceremony. Since the dedication, the people of Augusto have recovered many of the displaced headstones that had paved streets and were cast aside in the ghetto. They have been returned to the cemetery and stand watch over the consecrated ground. I haven't lost touch with my friends in Augusta. Regina Bozinska has written to me through the years. Her letters are filled with information about the cemetery. She writes, My dear lady, I want to inform you that the Jewish monument is in good order. The children from the Red Cross and I made a decision to take care of the monument. We go often and weed the ground and clean the stone. Dear Naomi, I visited the cemetery last week. Again, I saw that someone had come to bring flowers and light candles. As long as I live, I will remember about the monument and remind the children to take care of it. Your friend forever, Regina. The philosopher Santiana wrote, if we fail to remember history, we are doomed to repeat it. The cemetery at Augusto serves as a reminder that the memories must and will be kept alive for the generations that have gone before and for the generations still to come.